Okay. All right. Welcome, everybody. And uh, Tom, thank you so much for agreeing uh, to come here. I know you had to kind of move some time zones around. Ah, uh, yeah. No, that's fine. It's uh, good to be here and good to be talking to people. Yeah. All right. So why don't we start with a quick rundown: who you are, what you do, and um, and by what you do, I you know I'd love to really explore all of it. So not just okay. the uh, job side of it, but you know you also do a lot of training and you've got some gum roads and stuff like that. So why don't we start with um, uh, with the what you do? So work. So yeah, work, work related. I I uh, work in feature film. Uh, been working on um, how long have I been in the industry for? It's uh, seven and a half years I've been in the industry, but feature films I've been working on them for about five years. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no, it's it's been pretty good. And I'm uh, I'm kind of I'm basically considered a generalist because I do I do a multitude of things. I started my career at uh, Luma Pictures, and at Luma Pictures, I had to. It's it, because it's a small studio. They hire um, fewer people, but most people are generalists, yeah. and so you need to be able to do a lot of different things. Whereas right now I'm at Weta, and at Weta uh, I'm more specialised. And I applied for an, a number of jobs at Weta, but they just picked me up for texturing. So and yeah, I just took it. That's awesome. So is did you work at Luma over there in Santa Monica? No, no, I didn't. I, I started in their Melbourne studio in okay. Australia just just as they opened it. So oh, wow. they'd only been open a, a month or two. And yeah, and then I started there and worked there for four and a half years. So today you are a texture artist. Well, I, I'm a texture artist uh, at Weta, but I don't yeah. consider myself like solely a texture artist, but yes, that, that, that's primarily what I, I do it at Weta. That, yeah, that, that's my position. That's great. And, and I totally get that. So, because, you know, as artists, you're working the whole spectrum, um, especially when texture yeah. is like such a small, uh, part of that. Um, yeah. so, uh, can you describe what that is? Because, uh, a lot of people in here are familiar with games and in games, of course, you know, you know, this, it's like, you know, you're not a, you texturing is just one part of what everybody's expected to do. So tell me what that yeah. means when you're dealing with that in in terms of feature film. What do you end up doing? Um, so I'll be uh, delivered an asset which um, has UVs, and then I basically just go through the process of uh, creating all of the maps, whether it be color, displacement, bump, as well mm -hmm. as masks. Yeah, because masks can be used in the uh, in the look dev process. So yeah, I'm just required to deliver all these things and then that goes on to look dev and then they can put it all together for, for the final film. So how do you, than, yeah. How do you deal with materials when you're dealing with the uh, texturing? Cause uh, you know, you're, you're creating the texture, but then isn't texture and material kind of linked up? Yeah. So it, it depends. Uh, it depends on like the workflow of the studio, but uh, materials can either be assigned by uh, masks or by uh, geometry selection. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, in my personal work and in my personal workflow, I prefer to do it uh, strictly through masks just because it, it makes uh, the look dev process a bit, a bit more, I'm, I'm a bit OCD with that sort of stuff. And so it makes it a bit more, um, manageable I find but yeah it, it just depends on where you work it can be different but um, yeah okay all right and uh, so when you're talking about ma uh, textures and maps and, and things of that nature what software yeah. are you using I use Mari for, for texturing that's great and are you doing like diffuse albedo is it a PBR like you know how, what kind of setup because I know for a lot of people you know, it's like, do, am I working a diffuse map? What's happening now in the industry? Um, well, I find, in, like, in my in my own work, going to trying to come up with ways of working more uh, realistically, I think, is the way to go. Like, one thing that I've really uh, been looking into recently is a lot of maps 
you can cheat specular roughness using a specular roughness map, but mm -hmm. really in, in, in real life, a lot of the time, the roughness of the surface is due to displacement and displacement intensity. And so mm. the roughness is on like how many little bumps and things there are. Yeah. So I'm trying to create that sort of look uh, through that mentality of creating stuff more physically rather than um, relying on a map to kind of cheat it. Hmm. And what does that mean creating it more physically? Uh, like with, with the displacement. So, sculpting. so if you, if you had a, uh, no, not sculpting it, but even just, um, getting, you can either do it procedurally through mm -hmm. noises if you need to get like, so yeah, if it was a rougher surface and say you had like, a uh, industrial piece of plastic or something like that. And it has, and if you look very, very closely at it, it has all these little, um, round nubs on it. Yeah. And so then if you run a high frequency noise over a surface using displacement, it will actually displace that surface and then give it that rough look while keeping specular at 100% and 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 maybe not 100% gloss but w without having to use a roughness map to determine these things. Mm, that's a really great point. And so the alternative, and because I know we're getting quite technical here, but the alternative is yeah. somebody goes in there and they kind of fake the roughness here and there, which is really just yeah, you, faking you, the displacement. The the Exactly. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it'll just be a black and white map, which is used to to work out, oh, this area is more, more reflective and this area is more dull. And yeah. so... I'm playing with ways in my personal work to to generate those looks, but on a more realistic level, which means if you zoom in on an object, if you have to have a, say if an asset comes close to camera, it still holds up realistically. Yeah. So yeah, it's just little things like that, which I'm looking into like lately. All right. Well, we jumped right into the technical, folks. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> I Sorry hope you're that. still following along. That's <laughs> my fault. Um, but it was good because, you know, I, I wanted to get a little insight into, you know, what what's the language in this area. And so, you know, for some yeah. people, this won't make sense. But um, a texture artist, your job is basically like, what, what do you end up painting nowadays? Do you end up painting props or characters or environments or, you know, what kind yeah, of stuff? Can you give us an example? Yeah, it's been a mixture of things. Uh, like I worked on Rampage recently at yeah. Weta mm -hmm. and I, yeah, I had, I had the um, opportunity to work on um, multiple like hero vehicles. Uh, yep. I also helped out on the big lizard character. Um, uh, what else? Yeah, main, mainly vehicles and and Lizzie, the, the the crocodile character. But um, yeah, I I did like the A10, and so actually a good a good um, uh, yeah. So I worked on the A10, the jet. If you've seen the film, it's it's also in the trailer. But uh, it was my job as the texture artist to go through and. I had to paint on all of the rivets and all of the uh, all of the panel uh, panel edges, and mm -hmm. I looked at really uh, detailed reference. And right. so, and I was very particular on about like how many rivets are along this edge of the panel, and 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 doing all the decals and stuff like that. That's basically the job of a texture artist. Got it. What got you into this profession? Um, just, uh, well, it's actually funny. I went to university, mm -hmm. uh, to do traditional 2d animation cause I enjoyed drawing. Yeah. Animation and, too traditional. Yeah. Like how long ago did you go yeah. to school? Uh, eight years ago. All right. But, um, yeah. So th they just switched from t traditional to, uh, digital. So mm -hmm. they were doing it in Toon Boom. Yeah. Um, and so I did that and I actually found it very frustrating and I just, yeah, I just didn't really, it didn't come to me as, as quickly and, and I didn't, I really just didn't enjoy sitting down and slaving over frame by frame. And yeah. then uh, the course kind of split into 3D as well. And they gave us a little taste of 3D at the end of the first year because I, I was about to quit university mm. and I did, um, 
yeah, I, I did this little taste of Maya um, and I created this really basic uh, roller coaster and got a good mark for it. And I really, really found, I, I was really interested in that sort of work yeah. and I had no idea about it at that point in time. So uh, yeah, and I just went on from there and started self-teaching myself through resources on the on the web and mm -hmm. just got my skills up and until I got picked up by Luma Pictures, so. What was your first encounter with ZBrush like? Um, yeah, a lot of people say that they find the interface and, and the workflow really difficult. Yeah. But I, I found I picked it up uh, pretty easily, even though it's it, it like the interface is very different to Maya. Mm -hmm. But it I don't know, it came pretty organically to me. So I don't really understand when people say like, oh, I really struggle with working it all out. But I found like what once you get you learn the basics and things like that, it's pretty easy. And then as I would go on, I would watch tutorials for specific things to the point where now I feel really confident with the software. Yeah, that's great. And so maybe um, I think one of the things that you could help us um, figure out, especially since you have such a, a, a vast kind of command over the, the whole kind of pipeline here for characters. Yeah. Um, what are, how does character, let's say, how does texture artist fit into the spectrum of jobs? And, you know, what are some of the different responsibilities? So you talked about how a texture artist is, you know, you're, you're there, basically your job is to create maps on either those are like diffuse or specular or displacement or, or even just masks. Um, yes. And then, uh, so that's one part of it, but what else is it, um, what other jobs are there that kind of go around there and that are supportive? And maybe even what are some of the jobs that might, if somebody's kind of more in the entry level, that might help them get into those positions? Hmm. Um, really, uh, I guess entry level stuff is, is more, um, you're more working with like these days with the way technology's gone. Yeah. Um, you get a, a lot of scans, so from production. So mm -hmm. on set, they'll they'll scan a character, and then um, you'll have to go in, and then actually at, at the moment working at Weta, like I'll I'll get uh, projected textures. Uh, I'll get like the model from models, and then I'll get the scan, and then mm -hmm. we overlay them, and then transfer the maps and process that. And so that's it's it's not really. It's not that technical. You basically just not, need to know what buttons to hit, and that's kind of how it goes. So it's normally a job which is given to more junior artists, um, but that's also a difficult thing to try out at home unless you know how to do photogrammetry and and um, rebuild from photos a, a mesh using, um, uh, I think it's called capturing reality or reality capture mm -hmm. is, is a pretty good tool for that. But yeah, we'll do a lot of rebuilding and reprojecting, and then we'll have to go in and actually clean up where uh, there might be overlaps with other objects or there are crevices where the projection didn't quite get to. And we'll have to uh, build the maps based on uh, that information that we got from the scans. So, uh, and then if we don't have a scan for something, that's where you have to go in and use your skills and creativity of painting something from scratch and starting from a base and then adding the layers of details and complexity that are, that you might find on a, on a real world object, obviously mm -hmm. using references and stuff like that. So yeah, it just, it, it kind of depends, but I think if you have, if you want to start, if you want to become a texture artist in the, uh, in the feature film industry, I think just having a really solid uh, knowledge base of Mari and how Mari works, and um, yeah, you can. It, that'll take you a long way because I there are a lot. There aren't that many schools out there. I don't think that are even teaching Mari, so it's it's kind of difficult to 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 learn. But there is some stuff out there online, and and I I used a lot of that content to to learn how to how to use it. Yeah, Mar, I mean, you get it. You're getting more about substance painter, um, and Mari is definitely some, yeah. something that's up and coming. But it is so specific to feature film, you know, it's tough. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay. Definitely. All right. Um, so that's the texturing side, which also involves a lot of scan processing, things of that nature. What else um, do yep. we have? What other jobs are out there for people who are aspiring um, for this? Now, you know, a lot of the people that I talk to in this conversation is like is game artists. So their character, their environment, sure. um, something of that nature. Uh, what other options are out there uh, for people? Uh, so uh, are you saying specific, specifically for texturing or just like a foot in the door for feature film? I, you know, it might – it's kind of both. So I understand that in texturing we're talking about, you, you know, there's definitely working with scan data and, you know, some of that processing. I've known plenty of people that – to get in that way. But yeah, what yeah. other ways are there that people can get their foot in the door? Like imagine, for example, somebody here um, is in mobile games and they're, they're wanting to, you know, they're leveling up their career. They're getting their professional skills up. They're definitely mastering texturing and, and some high resolution modeling and all that stuff. Um, what are some of the ways that they can apply that? Some small jobs or things that might help them get in. Hmm. Um, well, like, I think to, to get into the, what, cause I, I get emails quite a lot of people sure. saying like, oh, how can I get into the industry and things like that. Yeah. And really like if I was to turn back the clock and, um, reapply again and, and go, go through the whole pro process with what I know now, yeah. I would really just try try my best to create something which looks realistic because because like it uh, yeah like a project which looks as realistic as i possibly can make it because in feature film we're always trying to make something look real and sit in sit in shot and if you can display that in a portfolio and really it can just be one piece like if you just focus on one portfolio piece and make it as real as you possibly can. And then you show that to an art director or whoever might be employing you at a company. Yeah. And they like the level of realism you've achieved, then they know that you should be able to achieve that for other other things that may be on a project, whether it be a, an environment or a prop. And so what I would suggest is doing an environment with say a prop in it, maybe it's a crashed car, maybe it's a train, maybe it's just, anything really but as long as you can get across that you understand what it takes to make something look realistic and you know like all the fine details you need to add and it takes a lot of practice but um yeah. Yeah. if yeah if you can get to that level i think that's the easiest way to get your foot in the door because a lot of the time it's it's really based on portfolio like a lot of the time they don't really they don't really care where you've worked previously or like it does help to have uh, some feature films under your belt. But if you have nothing, then um, yeah, that's, I think that's the best way to get in. Got it. Okay, great. Feature um, work is important and producing one piece. That's a kind of interesting topic because one of the things that I do in the boot camp is focus on this idea of, you know, one good solid piece. Like we had this student that yeah. really pushed this home to me, Niles, Niles Rush. And he was in mobile games and he created one character, one character, one character only. And uh, he worked on that thing for 40 hours a week for six months. He said he kind wow. of lost his mind a little bit <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> towards the two thirds way point. And, uh, and then he was telling me that in this job interview he had with the motion picture company, MPC, uh, they only looked at that one model and they hired him right there. They saw it yep. and they're like, yeah, that's it. You know, you're in. They didn't talk about any of his other work, any of his mobile games, nothing. One piece. Now, is that totally. an anomaly or does that totally make sense to you? No, I, that, that makes total sense. I, I strongly believe it's based on um, quality over quantity. So mm -hmm. that's it, if you have one really solid piece and – yeah, you can just – you can take that to a level which is really impressive, then I think that that would be your best ticket to, to get in somewhere. Mm, awesome. That's good to hear. Uh, all right, so I want to um, expand this a little bit because one of the things I think is really cool about what you do is you're not – you know, you're actually out there giving back to the community. And, and you know, actually right yeah. now as we speak, I'm, I've am i actually started this program I'm about to do of kind of helping people know how to – 
uh, teach online and all that kind of stuff. So okay, t- sure. tell me a little bit about the, the online stuff that you've been doing and the teaching because you, you teach at Gumroad. You, you put your stuff on Gumroad. Do you have anywhere else that yeah. you put your teaching? Um, there's a Chinese company who reached out to me and oh. they really liked my my BMG tutorial and mm-hmm. they – and I, and I did a deal with them where they translated every word I say oh. uh, to Chinese, and then they're, they're selling it to the to the Chinese audience, and I get a cut. So what? yeah, I, I sell it there as well. That's awesome. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. So walk me through your Gumroad, what you do there, and what got you into um, teaching. Well, I, I just I really love uh, helping people and and teaching people processes. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just comes really naturally to me. So, um, yeah, I just I I just had these workflows that I built up while working at Luma and yeah. just things because at Luma it was a it's a very uh, fast paced high intensity workplace which yeah. I I really enjoy and that meant that I had to come up with ways to quickly create um, assets and I'd ha- and I'd have to come up with ways which. I maybe had never seen before, but mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I just kind of breaking rules. Like what, once you get to know something well enough, you can start breaking the rules and making stuff faster, but more effectively. And so I, I had a bunch of ideas and I still do right now. I just haven't had time to create more tutorials, but right. um, yeah, I just wanted to put them into video form and share them uh, with the community. And so, yeah, I just started doing that and I, I st- just started with some free ones on my YouTube because I I don't think it's a good idea to start charging for your t- tutorials straight away because or your content because um, I was still learning about oh, what are the best practices in in teaching and um, and also they'd just be like little short quick tips and things like that like oh this is how you sculpt a rock because I'd been sculpting rocks for six months or something at yeah. Luma and. I'd, I'd come up with a, a pretty solid workflow to get a result which would get approved and put in shot. So, right, right. Um, yeah, just little ideas and snippets like that. And then it just grew bigger and bigger once I started developing bigger ideas and, and tutorials which took a, a bit more of my time. And sometimes I'd even take like a week or two off work just to develop some of these tutorials. So, yeah. Oh, wow. That's great. What kind of um, results have you started to see uh, from doing this in, in terms of like your online presence, um, you know, just in um, your life? How has it helped? It's, I, I think it's helped get my work out there a bit more. Uh, like, for example, this uh, free human anatomy yep. study that I, I put out. Yeah, yeah I, I decided to put it out for free just because... I just thought it'd be a good learning tool for people and I spent a lot of time finessing over it and I was like, I'll just give it out there because I, I charge for a bunch of other things mm-hmm. and it actually got picked up by a few places and they posted it online and then they linked my art station and I think it's like the most popular human and if you go into art station type in human anatomy, it's the second most popular post on um on art station. So I think stuff like that has brought me a lot of attention and also yeah. a few magazines have published my, um, my big mean giant. I, I did like a, a write up uh, of just like a breakdown of what the tutorial is about and then got that published in a couple of magazines. So yeah, uh, yeah I definitely think it helps with, um, with coverage and people knowing who I am. Uh, but yeah, it, it's, I didn't. I didn't start doing this for that reason. It was more for me to share my ideas and for me to get workflows and processes across to people. Got it. Um, has there been any like? Do you think it's helped the job at Weta or help you score anything specific? That, that's actually funny you say that because yeah. when I was having my interview with Weta, yeah. Uh, the guy interviewing me, he's like, "Oh yeah, so I saw your tutorial." And I think he <laughs> he what he watched because I do I do a little trailer which which is on my um, YouTube account just yeah. to show people like what they're getting and a bit of an explanation of of the tutorial. Mm-hmm. And he flicked through it and he actually had questions for me about processes <laughs> that I was doing in the in the tutorial. And yeah. 
he was like, oh, so why'd you do this and, and why'd you do that? And, and he asked me certain questions based on workflows that I was showing. And so I uh -huh. thought that was really interesting that he took interest to that and then was quizzing me about stuff that I was doing in the tutorial because it, I think in the end it actually gave him an idea of how I work. It's, he, he's not just seeing the final product. He was actually seeing like processes that I use, which were actually very similar to how Weta worked. And so then that made me an even better candidate. Oh, man, that's genius. That's yeah. great. So it, it did work out in a in a positive sense. That's awesome. I th and that's something I think, you know, because a lot of people are wondering, you know, do I create tutorials or not or videos and what do I have to share and all of that. But I mean, everybody's learning. So that's really cool to hear that the guy interviewing yeah. you actually like he's checking these things out himself. You know, he probably wasn't yeah. necessarily yeah. looking just for Tom Newberry, but he's just looking to learn. Yeah, yeah, possibly. Yeah. Yeah, so tell me, um, right now, what are some of the skills, like the industry skills, industry-specific things that people really need to focus on? Because I see you've done Mari, you've got XGen. Um, there's a lot of stuff that you focus on. What are the things that you think are most important for people thinking to get into either film or games, you know, at this point? Well, I, I think uh, there, there is a little bit of a difference between the two, just, mm -hmm. but I, I think... A lot of stuff is going towards realism these days. Yeah. And something that I think about a lot is I think technology is obviously going towards VR. And I think it's going to come a time where VR is going to, it's going to be, it's going to be a lot about realism, like trying to yeah. create, create realistic environments. Obviously we have to wait for technology to catch up to that level. But I think for, for me, I, yeah, I, I think it's different for a lot of people, but for me, it's subtleties in details, whether it be in an, in the anatomy of a character or uh, in the textural detail of a surface and things like that. I, I really think the details is what drives the quality of, of, of work, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally does. And, yeah. So, and so what does that mean? Like, can you show us one of your pieces and just break down what that means to, to have a okay. deeper level of focus? And especially when we're talking texture, because there I, you know, I'm sure that's probably one of the single most important um, skills for somebody to have is make sure that you are paying attention to the details. Yeah. So like this skull here, yeah. I, I was really happy with how this turned out. Mm -hmm. Um, and originally when I rendered this, I had the scale of the specular roughness, which are these micro scratches on the surface. I had it slightly too large, like just because because it, it's just a tileable, which is projected over the surface to make right. a really quick turnaround. And um, and I just made the, the texture a bit smaller and and closer to like more of a realistic level of detail. Yeah. And I just found it really even though it was such a subtle change, it just brought the whole piece together and just made it look a lot more, uh, a lot more pleasing. And so it's just little things like that, which, which really, which I think ma can make or break a piece. Like I think I, on this piece here, this one was a bit more of a rough one, but just the scale of these scratches on the surface here, mm -hmm. I just don't think they look as convincing, like especially up here. Can you see what I'm pointing at? Yeah, to? totally. A little bit thicker. Yeah. yeah, it's a little bit thicker and it just it just loses it a bit. Like you and you might not even like perceive that when yeah. you look at the piece, but mm. it's just it's just there in the back of your mind and it's just it's one little thing. But when I adjusted it for the skull render and got this really nice oh, yeah. sort of brushed look to it, it just looks way more realistic. And so it's just little it's it comes down to little things like that, which can can just completely change the game. And I might be looking at uh, um, people's work on ArtStation, and I'll see just little things like that, and I'm like, oh, I reckon if they just increase the frequency of that texture or or um, increase that displacement a little bit more, they would have got a more pleasing result, even though it might be like a minuscule amount difference. It just it just can change the look of something. So I think really focusing on details. Mm. And really looking at things around you in the real world, like try try to be try to be really um yeah, just try 
look at different surfaces and, and things like that. Like, oh, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a bit, it, it, you can go pretty deep with it, but I, I just really like to observe stuff in nature and, and stuff in the real world, which I then try to bring back to my own work. I got it. Yeah, that's great. That's a really good point. And um, one of the things that, you know, I like to point out to people is that you can usually, you know, unless it's really well done, you can usually tell when something's like a fake or it's a knockoff of a Gucci bag yeah. or it's a knockoff. Totally. Of yes. Models, right. And so what is it that tells us that? And this is kind of one of those things where it's like, you know, more than you think, right? There's this like subconscious, something's not right. I don't feel this. I feel like yes. something's not right. And, um, and that is like one of those things. If you can nail that in some work, then you, you know, you've really made something that makes you a candidate for a job, I feel. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Okay. Yeah, I agree with that. All right. Is there any software that you think is relevant? Like, do people have to know Mari or, you know, can they get industry um, training? You know, how does that work? Um, it, if we're talking about textures, textures yeah. um, Mari is, is very important when it comes to feature film just because it can, it drives a lot of, it's because it can handle so many UDIMs. And as yeah. I was just saying about in the details and the resolution and things like that, um, you can work at what much bigger um, resolutions. And so, like, I might be working on an asset and it's a car and it has um, 50, or maybe not 50, let's say 20 UDIMs uh, at 4K each. And so that's a ridiculous amount of detail, but that means that that would be for a hero vehicle. And so that means that if we have a close up on the side door of the car, it is still going to hold up in shot. Um, whereas I'm not sure, I, I really actually want to look at Substance Painter because they just updated a multi UDIM workflow, which apparently can handle quite. Um, quite a lot of resolution oh, wow. and so I kind of I, I kind of disregarded it uh, originally because it was only a single UDIM and in yeah. my in my line of work I was like oh that doesn't really apply to me but now that they've released this I'm very very interested in getting into it and really working out how it how it works because it may potentially replace Mari if it turns out to be a faster workflow and and a better process. So I wouldn't disregard uh, substance substance painter at all. Um, but at the moment, Mari is definitely the it is the primary use tool uh, for getting realistic high resolution textures for film. And for those who might not know, um, do you have an easy way that you could explain what a UDIM is? Um. So if you oh okay, so a UV. Uh, for those of you um, that don't know what a UV is, it's basically an unwrap of of a model. So a really gory way to explain this is if you get your face and you cut around your neck and then cut over the top and and then lay and then peel the skin off and lay it out flat on the ground, that's basically what a UV is of the face. So preferably you're, you're basically unwrapping. not your own face, but you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, preferably not your own face. Yes. Maybe yeah, somebody else's. You, and so then that'll be a UDIM, and then you can then have multiple um, UDIMs, and so and you can go infinite. You can have an infinite number of them, but basically it's just it's just the unwrapping of the model laid out in a way that you can then tap texture in a in a 2d environment if need be but the way mari works is you can actually paint directly on the surface so yeah. of the 3d model and you you can switch between the two so yeah okay great yeah same like substance and now we know um what your other job would be if you weren't a cg artist so we're very glad you're a cg artist uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right tell me about branding you know, uh, because you got a cool logo, all that stuff. Oh yeah. Uh, so talk to me about branding and how you've kind of established yourself as a as an artist out there. Um, I didn't really, I didn't think too much about branding. I was always obsessed with coming up with a logo for myself for some reason. Like even when I was in in primary school. So no way. Uh, and then just yeah, just 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 because like 
you know, kids would like draw graffiti in their books and stuff like that. And I'd, I'd always be trying to come up with a way to get T and N to look cool together. And I could never come up with something. <laughs> I love that. And then one day, one day I just modeled a cube with an N and a T in, um, in Maya. And I, yeah, I just came up with this design and then, um, my girlfriend, she's a digital designer and yeah. I just sent her some, some images that I just jet. Cause I, I, I literally, rendered this logo out of Maya just using flat shades oh, and then sweet. she then took it and then turned it into a, a, a voxel and then I could use that for anything. So yeah, I just came up with that logo and I, re I really liked it and I, I never really thought about creating a brand for myself, but mm -hmm. I think if you do want to do that and w which I have kind of done in this process yeah. is you just have to keep your same you got to keep your name the same wherever you put it online mm -hmm. so that people can always relate back to it. Because I've seen some people and they'll have a different name somewhere and then a different name somewhere else. Oh, that and that's drives me nuts. for people. Yeah, exactly. And then so you need to keep your name consistent. And then, yeah, it, it helps to come up with a cool logo. And then I just use that logo everywhere. I use it on my website, on my Instagram, on my art station. Um, yeah, I just use it anywhere I can. Where, where it's a professional setting where I'm displaying my work. Got it. And how important is social media to you now? Um, as we do this, I'm actually looking up your Instagram. But uh, how oh, yeah. important is social media to you and, and to the job and to connecting with people and all that good stuff? Well, it's it's actually really funny. Um, I, I kind of wasn't that interested in Instagram for the longest time. I yeah. was... Like all my all my friends were on it, and and th these are people who aren't creatives, and they were like, oh, why don't you get on Instagram? Like you should get on, and and I'm like, oh no, I don't I don't have time for that sort of stuff. And right. then one day I just noticed that a lot of artists who I follow personally were moving onto that platform, and uh, and I would constantly go on there, and they would post stuff on there and nowhere else, and I was like, oh, how can I like. I don't know, like this or comment on it if I'm not a part of that community. So I then ended up signing up for, for um, Instagram. And this and and yeah, I just started posting my work and then and then I started to kind of test myself and start posting daily. And uh, I don't do it every day, but I just try to wake up in the morning before work, do a couple of hours. And then um, post, and my, my, my plan is to post something on eight o'clock, which is when I shut down and then head to work. Um, and yeah, I just started getting on a roll. And now I'm in a position where I'm in a, in a, I'm in a routine, which is the easiest way to do it is to get into a routine. So you got to do it all the time. And then you just wake up like clockwork, do some work. And, and it just means that I'm getting stuff done. And I'm also building a bigger following as well. So mm -hmm. it's, 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 less, it's actually less about, at the moment, it's less about getting a following and it's more about me just practicing. And, this, and knowing that I have an audience who is somewhat expecting me to post something, it kind of really drives, drives me to just sit down and get something done because... Before I got onto Instagram, I'd really struggle with the whole process of sitting down, starting something fresh or working on something old or whatever. I just really struggled with that getting started part. Mm -hmm. But now that I'm in such a routine of wake up at six, uh, quickly get ready in whatever way I need to and then just start working and work for an hour and a half to two hours and, um, and then just getting that little pocket of work done for the day, I feel so much more fulfilled and oh, yeah, it's yeah. just good to get something out. It's great. That's great. Um, I started doing that about a, a month ago, a little bit more regular than usual and man, it just makes the day yep. so beautiful. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> just nice. So, uh, does that mean you're more of a morning person or what about working late at night? Cause I know a lot of us, CG yeah. people, you know, we get into that crunch and then you, you have to wake up late and it's a vicious cycle. Yeah. I, I, I am lucky enough to be one of those uh, crazy morning people. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I find it really easy to wake up in the morning. Um, but because I wake up early, I I kind of burn out like in at, at night time. So, yeah. As the other thing is, in the morning, I just feel so much 
more creative. Like I can get into the zone yeah. so much faster in the mornings than I can in the afternoons or at night. It's just, it's almost instant. Like I'll just get into ZBrush and start working and I'll be playing some music and I'll be in the zone. But if I come home at night and I'll, I'll continue working on something that I started in the morning and it'll just, I don't know, I just won't be able to get there and everything I'm doing, it's just not really looking the way I want it to. And the contrast between how, how my personal work is in the morning and, and in the afternoon is night and day. So I yeah. really like to focus my time in the mornings. But it just depends uh, on the person, I think. I don't think it's the same for everyone. So, um, yeah, it's just what works for you and, and figuring that out. That's great. All right. We're getting to that phase, guys, where we got some questions. It's going to get time for you to ask um, some questions first to get some um, stuff in there. Uh, but, um, Tom, if I was to ask you, what is, you know, one thing that an aspiring 3D artist could focus on? I, I know we probably already actually hit this, but I just want to be real clear about it. What's like one thing that they could focus on that's just going to increase their chances of, of nailing that job or, or just making themselves a candidate for a job? Uh, I think personal work is a huge deal. Mm -hmm. um, just making sure that you're working on your skills and refining your workflows and, and things like that. Just really yeah, and, and trying to get try get to your work daily. Like try, even if it's just a quick hour or a qu even a quick half an hour, just daily just do something because every every little bit of work you put in goes towards uh, where you'll eventually get to, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like you just need to put in that little bit of extra effort every day because, for example, at the moment, I do absolutely no sculpting at work. But sculpting is my favorite thing to do. And mm -hmm. so I just make sure I do that at home every day. And even though I'm doing a job right now where I don't sculpt at all, I think my sculpting has actually progressed in the last year that I've been at Weta, even though, yeah, I'm, I'm only doing that in my personal time, which is realistically two hours a day. And so, and, and that's if I get to the, those two hours, which I make, I make a point to do so. But right. um, if I wasn't doing that, I, I would be staying stagnant. So I really think just practicing as much as you possibly can and, um, yeah, just working on your skills is probably, yeah, that, that, that's the biggest thing. That's awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Now, I think what we might do now is switch this, uh, switch this things over, guys. I'm going to ask some questions that you guys have. And then, uh, Tom, if you don't mind, I'd love to switch screens and start showing you some people in the, uh, in the network and just start get, having a conversation about work. Yeah. No, that sounds good. Okay. So let me switch this over. Uh, presenter. Uh, no, I just make myself a presenter. Okay, and let me get artist a week. Oh, there we go. Okay, let me know, Tom, when you can see my screen. Yep, I can see it. Okay, great. I'm going to go through questions real quick, guys, just to see. Edison, yeah, do me a favor, Edison, send me a link. Um, Jan is asking, are you guys using World Machine at all for any of the stuff? Uh, like World Machine at work or World yeah. Machine personally? Uh, at work. At, at work, um, well, I, I only do texturing, so I don't use it myself. Uh, and I'm not sure, yeah, because I'm not part of the modeling department, I'm not 100% sure if they use it or not. Cool. All right, uh, Corinne is asking, for portfolio work, would one prefer a mixture of of your own style of work and also styles of work inspired by your company. And really that question is, you know, is, do we have to produce work to one particular style and, and how do you really frame your work so that it's kind of attracts, you know, that job? Yeah, I, I think style is definitely dependent uh, more in games than it is film. Mm -hmm. Cause as I said earlier, film is more based in reality so it's going to be determined by how realistic the work is. If yeah. I see, like, I've seen in the past a number of uh, portfolios come through and every piece will be this stylized sort of, like, almost Pixar-style looking yeah. thing. 
but they're applying for a VFX company, which really doesn't make sense. So you'll be overlooked instantly. But if you if you want to work in um, full animated feature films like Pixar and Disney and things like that, those are then the places you'd want to apply for. And and the inverse is the same. Like if I took my portfolio and applied at Pixar, I'm pretty sure they'd just look at it and be like, well, you're not really showing us the style of, mm-hmm. of what we do. And so I would struggle to get a job there. So right. I think that is important to direct it towards the sort of work you want to do. Um, yeah. Awesome. All right. Uh, Josh is asking, uh, what are your thoughts on manually painting skin skin versus projection versus both? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. It's something I've really been thinking about because I follow a, a few artists online who who um, who do manual painting and, and they do a really amazing job. Uh, I think it, it depends. Like, I think manually painting is going to take longer to get to that realistic result because you have to go in and make sure you have all those details and everything. Mm -hmm. Um, Whereas projection is faster and you know you're going to get a realistic look right out of the box. So um, I I kind of want to do a hand-painted skin map, which I haven't done before, but just to basically just to test myself and see if I can achieve something that looks realistic. But, Yeah. uh, yeah, it just depends. Like... When I do a lot of my personal work, it's it's time restricted, and so I try get the best quality of work uh, with the least amount of time, and usually that comes down to projecting maps. So, yeah, got it. Okay, all right. So let's take a look. The first one I've got here is by uh, Josh Wallace, okay. and uh, you can see the screen here. So this is one of the p- things that they do in uh, Josh is in the boot camp. So. The first part of the bootcamp, okay, first cool. sprint that we do is make a prop and focus on authenticity and realism, not made up. It has to be something that's real. Uh, and they use substance and it's game focused. So you'll see the So it's game res. resolution and everything, yeah. right? Yeah, you'll see some okay. topology where the goal was to make it lower res. Um, but okay. what would be really great is to get, uh, a, like what I like to do is tell people or get for my students uh, a clear sense of what's working, what's not working. So the way I like to ask this is like, what do you find here that really just communicates to you that this person is a candidate for the job? And what is it that communicates to you that they're not a candidate for a job? Okay. Um, Because this is game related, it's a little more difficult for me to comment on just because it like instantly I look at this and I review it in the mindset of film. But um, from, from, like, like just looking at it straight away, uh, the roughness on materials looks like they could have a bit more uh, variety. So if you go back to that first frame you were on, if you look at the handle, mm-hmm. the plastic and the metal, uh, so you've got the plastic handle down on the bottom left and then you've got the metal bar and the specularity on those and then the specularity on the box itself they're all very similar and you want to get more uh variation in in your work so and then that's what will make it look realistic so at the moment the specularity of those three regions looks very similar to me and that's just yeah more more variety really will help sell a piece uh a lot more um great but apart from that like you've got some nice texture breakup on the on the funnel piece up the top and and the radial uh, bump or normal map, I'm assuming on the on the vinyl disc is is re- a really nice touch. And also the the break up that you've got on the wood, it looks it looks nice, but you might be able to increase the contrast a bit more just to get some more variation in there and and a bit more wear to it. That, that that's actually the other thing you to to make something look real you need to add really subtle details. So like there might be a little bit of paint chipped off on a corner or a little bit of dust on a surface. It's things like that which will make it sit in the real world much better than just being a completely clean uh, looking asset. Awesome, great, thank you. Okay, and uh, let's take a look. So here's Corinne and she went through the character boot camp. Uh, okay, cool. Josh, yeah, we'll get to, I'll get back to the orc then. And, um, and so, you know, she's, uh, let's get a sense of full progress. 
So she has been on this model and working really, really hard. Here is something she did nine months ago. And then okay. uh, this is the piece she did yeah, nine months ago. And then um, nice. I feel like there was some great growth uh, that she had in this piece. So what yeah, definitely. that you think is communicating um, that she's not a candidate yet and what is communicating that she is a candidate or she has potential? Um, okay. So once again, it's, it's game related, so yeah. it's not really my forte, but uh, I think when it comes to characters, anatomy is obviously extremely important. And yep. there are some things that I'm seeing here, both in the silhouette and the, ana and, and the anatomical build of the character yeah. that could be better. For example, like the neck. Um, I'm not very good with the names of muscles, but the, the ex external mastoid, maybe? Mm -hmm. is that what it's called? Sternocleomastoid, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That... Um, that one, they look a bit thick for a female, especially at the base where they connect to the uh, to the collarbone. Um, and then uh, where the, the pit at the base of the bicep looks a bit too deep. Uh, with, with, a, with a female character, especially, you need to be very careful with, uh, with, with the details. You've got to be really subtle with forms and things like that. I myself, I, I, I still really struggle with, um, with female characters mm -hmm. just because, yeah, you just, you have to be really subtle with them. Otherwise they'll look too bulky or they'll look too emaciated or they'll, it's really difficult to get it right. And right. so, um, also the, the silhouette around near where the rib cage is, it looks a bit, like it truncates too quickly, yeah, around that area. Um, so it's just really, it, it just all comes with practice and doing this over and over and over again. Um, but yeah, just finding areas which don't look quite right and then just trying to fix them and, and um, yeah, just continue working it and working it till you get it to a place which which really helps. But I, I like the textural work that she's got going here with the with the dirt and the and the blood on the pants and things like that, it's stuff like that which will it adds story to the character. So yeah, seeing stuff like that's great. Awesome, great. Uh, and then uh, let's take a look real quick at Josh's work. Yeah, there we go. Okay, cool. So this is more of a high res um, sculpt. Yeah. Uh, although he's got it in Marmoset here, but yes. Okay, cool. Rendering in Marmoset. Yeah. All right. So, um, yeah, once again, just a big focus on uh, anatomy and, and anatomical forms and stuff like that's important. Even though it's obviously an orc head, you still want to be pulling from, um, from real life. So the things that Pop stand out to me the most is probably the corners of the mouth where the bottom obviously I'm, I'm assuming that you're wanting to put in uh, teeth there or you want the bottom jaw to look like it's jutting out more but the lip seems to kind of uh, terminate a bit too late it looks like it should terminate a little earlier into the corner of the mouth <clears throat> um, also the jawline looks a little bit rough um, it should be a bit more streamlined where it comes and connects to the chin. So it, to me, it looks like you've, you might've gone too high res too early, really make sure that your primary forms are solid, uh, in the, in the lower resolution before upping, upping your resolution and really get, get your forms really, really tight at, at the, uh, at the primary form level before going into the detailing phase. Because it looks like you need to put a bit more work into that before applying um, the details over the top. Cool. All right. Great. Thank you, Josh. We got to um, run, so I'm gonna have to leave it at two. Uh, and then Edison. I want to get uh, a good look at Edison. Edison is doing going into the environment, and so this is all texture done inside okay, cool. of substance. All right. Nice. Cool. Um, yeah, no, it looks good. So you can see here where you've got, uh, if you go back up one, up one image, the, the image just above this one, 
you've got I can see some sort of like chipping on the on the feet some paint chips and things like that if I'm not wrong and also a bit of rust around the base of that bell um, looking shape things like that is really important and I really like the discoloration of the metal uh, on the on the section which which you listen through that's really cool where you've got a bit of gold showing through uh, with the silver yeah that's really great um, yeah no this looks it looks pretty cool, definitely. It's it, but it's things like that you, that you really want to focus on to drive your work to looking more realistic. Mm -hmm. That's great. Okay, and then uh, let's see if I can go back. This is his entry over at the rookies, um, and the rookie side is super slow, guys. Uh, so bear with me. Okay, all right, and uh, maybe we can look at this. Oh, so I actually haven't seen this. Um, Edison, so I'm glad to see this, but uh, let's just cycle through it. That's the photographer, the reference. Okay, cool. So, yeah, you're using reference. Yeah. Nice. Is that a game? And then here's his, um, I think that's the low res, not the not the high res sculpt, although he did do a high res. Okay. Oh, wow. All right. Lots of details. Uh, lots of detail. Wow. Way to go, man. Um, okay. And then in game screenshot. There we go. And maybe I can zoom out. Okay, there. cool. There we go. Yeah, so, yeah, no, this is looking quite good. Um, so let's, the, um, like, what makes us, and in fact, with Edison, I think it's probably important. Um, what is it that's, are there any flags that say amateur, still learning, not ready yet? Is there any flags on here that tell us that right off the bat? Um, well, no, like... For for a game for a game res asset, like mm -hmm. it's looking pretty solid. I I like the fact that there are signs and they've got text on them, and then there are like some little posters down on the bottom right. Like yeah. you really want your asset to tell us tell a story. The, even the chair down in the bottom left, that's really cool. Um, as long as long as like you can tell a story with and and the building in this case looks aged. So yeah, you just really need to make sure it. it it looks the only thing which stands out to me is probably the the um the guttering across the top the red guttering the texture up there looks a little bit tileable and mm, I see maybe it. a bit too broken up and so just stuff like that can really stand out and you just want to make sure that you you um yeah you don't have any tiling and and things like that but um but yeah other than that it looks like a pretty solid job to me Awesome. Great. All right. Let me check real quick. Is there anybody else that posted a link? Siri. Okay, great. Yeah, let me get a look at your Siri and then, yeah, that'll be good. All right, then we'll call it a day, guys. I got to run actually into a class. Um, so let's look at this one by Siri. Okay. And then, uh, you don't want to show Siri your latest, um, the gun. If you can post a link, that'd be great just so I'm not looking for it. Uh, but here, yeah, so this is the low poly. Um, here's okay. the high poly model. So we use that process where we always, you know, basically it's it's low res for the game, but they're prepped for anything. So they model it quite yeah. high res. And uh, and there you go. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, this this is looking really cool. Like I, I actually had to look at it for a second Ask myself if this was for film or game, because uh, especially up in the top left, where you've got the rough uh, leather underneath, like that, that looks really cool, and you've got breakup on there, and it it looks convincing, which is the main thing. So, um, I know it's meant to be an aged. Uh, yeah, I'm looking. Is that the reference up in the top right? It looks like that's the reference, right? Well, if that's the reference, then, um, yeah, no, it's looking pretty good. I was just going to suggest, like, maybe some of the metal uh, the metal objects or the metal materials have a bit more ping to them, as in texturally. Uh, I mean, sorry, in specularity. Um, but, yeah, apart from that, it's looking quite good. I like the scratches on the leather and um, the imprint you have here as well. It's Yeah, it's looking pretty good, definitely. Oh, I might have lost you. I can't hear. 
Hello? 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 Sorry, I was just unmuting myself. <laughs> Oh, okay. And forgetting about it. So yes, okay, there you go. This is the this is the other piece by Suri. Okay. Okay, can you can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Testing one, two. Okay, is it good now? I can hear you, yeah. Okay, okay, cool, cool. All right, so this is this is the gun that I'm looking at? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, no, this looks pretty cool as well. Uh, it's a bit hard to tell in this lighting environment. Uh, I would strongly, so yeah, I'd suggest trying to get a bit more of a high contrast lighting environment where mm -hmm. it doesn't look as flatly lit because at the moment, the top image, it's, it's a ran, I'm assuming it's a render, but it actually almost looks like a 2D drawing just because it looks quite flat. So I would strongly suggest lighting your environment in a way that it adds more contrast and it really makes the details pop and also shiny areas will look more shiny and, and things like that. But yeah, it, it looks it looks quite cool with, um, with the breakup and things like that. Maybe a bit heavy on the breakup, like you might be able to, uh, yeah, have breakup just in, in in more in areas where it makes sense i guess yeah. so like obviously on the grip there's some really nice uh it's shinier there from it being held um but yeah the break the breakup overall looks like it might be a little too heavy but at the same time it depends on like the world that this gun exists in like it, this might have been thrown around in the back of a trailer or something like that so but yeah no it looks like You've definitely got the right idea here, but yeah, just work on your lighting. I think that's the main thing that would really make this piece shine. Cool. All right, great. And that's something, um, sorry, when you get that into Marmoset, because um, Irie's not giving you that control. So, all right, uh, let's see, Christine, let's take a look. There's this and this. Okay, so uh, last, we will do this one. Um, Christina, and uh, is this the latest piece? Is this that the the final one? Okay, great. Yep, got it. All right. So, what's one thing that's working and one thing that's not working? You know, just so that there's an actionable thing that we can uh, we can adjust. Okay. Sure. Sure. Um, I think what is working is the uh, breakup that you have in the metal. How you have it it looks like a bit of a tarnish. And so you have some areas which are darker, some areas which are lighter. I think that's really, that's quite effective. Mm -hmm. um, and then something which could be worked on some more is probably the, the gen, like the big, uh, the black material, basically giving it like some more dense and, and some more wear to it. It's looking a bit too clean. Mm -hmm. um, that would be the main thing that I would suggest. Like, I, I'm expecting to see maybe a normal map which has some like dents and stuff like that because these helmets are really heavy and they get thrown around a lot and yeah I could really and bumped into things like when you're wearing it and so yeah I could definitely see some more definitely some more surface detail whether it be normal map or spec roughness I, I do see you have a bit of that happening at the moment uh, subtly but I think with an asset like this you might need to um, increase that a bit. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Tom. I know this is early. I, it sounds like we got um, we interrupted your sculpting time a little bit. <laughs> oh, no, it's okay. it's Saturday, all day. Okay, good, man. I really it's number one. Great to meet you, and um, and I'm really a big fan of all the educational stuff that you've been putting out. I think I got your anatomy figure a bit ago. That was what kind of prompted this phone call. So, uh, okay, great. Yeah, thank you so much for for everything you do. Okay. Yeah. And, and thanks for having me on. I, yeah, I hope some of what I said made, made some sense and, and people got something out of it. Absolutely. All right, guys, you know where to find him, Tom Newberry, and uh, he's got his own URL. He's also over there on Gumroad. So make sure you head over there and uh, load up on some resources. 
that you'll need. And, um, and then we go from there. Have an awesome weekend. Cool. Yep. Yep. And you guys as well. All right. Take care, Tom. See ya. Bye.